Hi, I'm Mike McLean. Welcome to the Short Circuit Podcast, brought to you by Swift Aircraft. In this series, we'll be chatting with a variety of people from all walks of life, but who all have one thing in common, aviation. We'll discuss how and why they got into aviation, what or who inspired them, and what they would say to encourage young people to get involved. Flight fascinates many of us, and our guests will explain why they are compelled to look to the sky. Today's guest on the short circuit is Bev Reardon. I met Bev on the British Women Pilots Association stand at Aero Expo earlier in 2023. I just said hello, and immediately we were off into a long and thoroughly enjoyable discussion covering a wide range of topics. And it wasn't just small talk. We touched on so many areas where you would normally tread carefully when talking with strangers, but Bev's open and charming personality made it easy. To me, it was obvious that this was a person that I should maintain contact with for the future. And when we started selecting guests for the podcast, it was a no-brainer to put her on the list. But rather than me tell you about her, I'll let her tell you herself. So, let's listen into the chat. So, uh, good evening, uh, Bev Reardon. How are you this evening? I'm really well, thank you, Mike. And how are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Thank you very much for joining us uh, here this evening on The Short Circuit. So what we're going to do in the age-old fashion, we're going to start with question number one. And question number one is, who are you and what is your current role uh, with regards to aviation? Well, thank you, Mike. So my name is Bev Reardon. Uh, My current role in aviation is that, first and foremost, I'm going to say, is that I'm a volunteer for the British Women's Pilots Association and I volunteer with them on many different levels. But also I'm a STEM and STEAM freelance consultant as well as a senior academic at the University of Derby. So my role as the STEM consultant is really to work with places such as museums, um, anywhere really that's got an interest in aviation and STEM and STEAM. And I instigate and kind of create projects that will enable them to be offered out to young people from schools, uh, home education, et cetera, to get them excited and interested into the world of aviation. Right. Okay. Well, it sounds like exactly the sort of person we should be talking to. So um, we at Swift, we have a a very strong uh, interest in STEM and STEAM and it's, Finding people that are getting involved around the country is uh, is, is part of my job, and uh, doing the whole inspiring aviation thing. It's I mean I I, I find it um, very very satisfying. I, I take it you feel the same way. Oh, absolutely yes. I mean you know from a young child, aviation was always something that um, I was interested in. You know even on a on a fantasy level, really I suppose, but. I think with many people then and even today, they don't perhaps realise how to get into aviation. It's not on their radar at all. And I think that's a great shame because there are so many opportunities and so many different ways to get involved. And not everybody has to fly a plane. There are so many different roles that are so rewarding. You're saying all the right things, so that's that's fantastic because that's exactly what we've been trying to say to a lot of people all the way through, uh, not just in this podcast series, but since Swift Aircraft started, is trying to get engaged and involved with other people, especially young people. Um, so talk about young people, yeah. and you said so from when you were a nipper. So what got mm. you started? What was was there any one particular thing that? got you inspired or interested or something that you saw and took your breath away? Oh, I, well, absolutely. All those things, actually. We were, um, if you cast your mind back, I think it would have been 1973. So I'm kind of giving my age away there. I was, okay. I was a small child, a very young child. And we were on holiday in, in Weymouth on the beach mm-hmm. when we heard this huge bang and it was Concorde. And they were test oh, wow. doing the test flights for Concorde. 
out over the English Channel. I, I, I imagine it was probably way, making its way to another airfield. But mm -hmm. that week we saw Concorde on a number of occasions and it totally fascinated me with the sound, the sort of supersonic sound. And my dad explained to me, because he was a bit of a plane geek, really, although he'd never flown himself, um, what that sound barrier was and how exciting Concorde was. And I think from that moment, I was absolutely hooked. And I used to go home and get all of the things out of the, the shed and build a pretend flying machine. And in my mind, I was actually flying that, over the hills you know and and over the neighborhood i could actually see the rooftops i mean my poor friends that i used to rope in to sit in the passenger seats probably <laughs> not so much but um i used to convince people that it would actually fly and they, they could come and sit in it you know so it was right from that age really that is a powerful imagination that, that, that's that sounds great so um i was never lucky enough to see concord go supersonic i Saw it coming in and out of Heathrow numerous times, but uh, never saw it go supersonic. That must have been something else. I, yeah, I mean, I'm not even sure now when I think back, and I, I've tried to sort of reference it on many a sort of Google search, and I'm not sure if I actually saw it go supersonic or if we heard the boom from where we were. I don't know, but it, le it left such a lasting impression because it was such a beautiful looking aircraft you know it was so unusual with the big sort of long nose cone and it's something that i just thought you know one one day um i'd really love to get to fly that but sadly i think yeah. that's uh, <laughs> that's not to be <laughs> yeah you're not not the first person on this show to uh just to, to regret not managing to get on concord off the ground uh i think a lot of us have managed to get in yeah. the, the ones in the museums we've been inside but uh Getting airborne, yeah. that, that was for the privileged, I think, you know, but uh, hey, oh, hey -ho. Absolutely. I must admit the, yeah. my earliest sort of wow moment with aviation was also on a beach and that was watching a, a Vulcan do aerobatics over Skegness and uh, I can, I can still feel it in my chest now. If I think about it, I can feel my chest rumbling and that was, th these, yes. these moments when you're a child if they happen to you, they stick with you. I mean, that's that's it. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely, they do. Yeah, the hair still, the hair still goes up on the back of my neck. You know, whenever there's anything flying overhead, and it could be something quite boring and mundane, but I still have that urge to look up at the sky, and I think you never lose that. No, no, that'd be a sad thing to lose, definitely. So, um, you, you said that you were an academic uh, at and at the university. So, how did you get? into that sort of role um i mean does that did you go straight oh. from school or what's the story there absolutely not no it's a meandering pathways i think many people's many people's is you know uh, people imagine that um very often people want to be something and it's a very straight linear journey and they know what to do and how to get there and and very often unless you're very very lucky that isn't the case at all and i think you stumble into things because you know, I think careers advice at schools has always been tricky. Mm. Um, you know, there are so many different careers and so many different young people wanting to be different things that no one person can possibly hold all that information. But at the same time, I think, you know, certain things do need to be addressed. And maybe it is professionals from the industry that need to plug those gaps. And we need to go in and and tell people exactly how to do things because I think we assume knowledge. We certainly from my experience from, you know, visiting schools is that people seem to assume that they know how to do this. And even for engineering, if, if young people don't take maths and science at, you know, at A level or BTEC or whatever, it can put them straight out of a whole STEM career because they won't have those building blocks there in the first place and very often people don't know that and you know you talk about engineering courses and and you'll see particularly parents who and they're sort of oh I don't, I don't want my daughter doing engineering it's dirty and heavy and oily and they you know there isn't the concept there that there's lots of different types of engineering mm -hmm. and i think these these gaps need to be addressed because 
it's quite possible for somebody to spend forty thousand pounds going through university or they could spend forty thousand pounds learning to be a helicopter pilot but nobody ever gives you that choice that i think that option is is there but it's it's in the shadows it's in the background yeah and it's these sort of opportunities that really need to be brought to the forefront so that you know young people who have perhaps never never had anything to aviation you know they don't they don't know anyone that flies suddenly this could be on their radar yeah it's i, I think you you're quite right i mean back in the day um when i was doing engineering the other students used to be re refer to engineers as plumbers and that mm. was the the whole status thing was if you're doing engineering then you are just you know picking up heavy bits of metal and getting your fingernails dirty and and that's it and there was no recognition of what engineers actually do and it, it it's a shame that there is that whole status and stigma thing it's because it's it's nonsense but it's a real thing unfortunately it is and you know i think we've all worked really hard to break down these barriers and you know certainly you know i i done quite a lot on this you know with events such as women in engineering and, and aviation but again you can't reach everyone and the information that's out there is not I think not not getting to people it's not getting to the target audience and somehow we need to address that mm. it's an industry thing yeah I mean so as a woman in engineering and as a woman in aviation did you find mm. that uh, there was a challenge. Did you get pushback from uh, other engineers and other aviators, especially men, but I suspect possibly even other women? Yeah, I mean, it's a strange thing, actually, because I I, I, I didn't actually go into engineering. and But the reason I didn't go into engineering is because I didn't know any women that did engineering. Mm -hmm. Nobody spoke to me about a career in engineering, even though I was really interested in taking things apart, putting things back together to build stuff with lego and meccano and design things nobody ever said to me engineering this is what you should do mm. and i know that this was a long time ago and i know that things have changed but they didn't and as such i went off down a completely different route i did the next best thing to engineering which was graphic design because that was still measuring it was still using spaces it was planning and that's that's really where i cut my teeth and that's what i did um, and it wasn't until later that I got the opportunity to work within the engineering department that I really sort of found my feet, really, and got involved in so many different STEM projects. Uh, alongside, obviously, you know, when you're at home, you make things and create things and take things apart and get them to work again. But the barriers were all there. But I, I think I think you're right. I think a lot of the barriers are from are from other women to a certain extent. Yeah. Mm. And in aviation, did you find pushback there? No, not at all. I mean, I've actually found that with aviation, it's it's one of the friendliest um, industries that you could ever get into. And again, I lament not being given the information at the right age to have able to have pursued it from you know from 16 really and to have gone through sort of a levels to to degree etc yeah. i mean i don't think apprenticeships were about then actually i think they stopped apprenticeships at that point but yeah you know it's it's very friendly i've never felt like an anomaly i don't think i know any other women who fly that feel like they're an anomaly either I think everybody's been very welcoming. I think the aviation industry has tried very, very hard, certainly at grassroots level, to involve women, to get more women in the air. And that is a truly fantastic thing. I think the work has to start to actually get them to put their foot over the threshold in the first place. Right. I think that's where the problem is. Okay. Well, that's 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 a very positive message I'm, I'm i'm pleased and satisfied with that that's good that's good because it's not, not what i expected you to say but uh i'm surprised but pleasantly <laughs> surprised so that's that's a good thing that's a good thing i was i was pleasantly surprised too <laughs> excellent excellent so sticking with aviation then so you've been 
so when did you start flying? When did you get into aviation? How, how did that happen? It took me a very long time. I think like many people, I always thought it was something that was too expensive, that it was not affordable. It was not something that somebody like me would be able to afford to do. And so my first sort of step into it really was something that I thought was manageable, was affordable, and that was paragliding. Right. So I, I started paragliding um, probably around 10 years ago. So yeah, quite, quite late really. Um, it took me, I'd always wanted to do it. I'd probably been looking at it for about the last 20 years and finally got around to it. And I really enjoyed it. Um, it's very physical, obviously. You've got to carry your stuff up high hills and things like that. But I absolutely loved it. I enjoyed it very, very much. Um, from that, I moved on to the local gliding club. Right. Because uh, uh, I had a bit of an accident with my feet and I needed to have an undercarriage, shall we say. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. But again, the gliding club was great. And it was only then that I realised that if you join a local gliding club, that for a young person, that is a really cheap way to get in the air because for membership for young people, it's something like £50 a year. Right. Um, you just pay for your pay for the toes as you go, so long as you stay there and volunteer all day. And there were lots of members there who were 14 who were solo. And I found that incredible. I couldn't believe that a 14-year-old could could go solo in an airplane. I, and yeah. I just thought that was a wonderful thing. And it's, they're all very responsible young people. I, I suspect there's a bit of Darwinism there. You you don't get to last very long if you're not sensible and cautious and, and follow the rules. Well, indeed, indeed, yeah. indeed, yeah. yes. But um, it's a great way to get into flying. And now I do, you know, as far as I can, if if I meet anyone that's that's interested and doesn't know how to start, I'll always point them towards gliding because it's absolutely, you know, the most affordable way to start, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not the first person to say that, but it's, it, it does make sense. Um, and it's maybe something, I think for a lot of people in aviation, gliding is the forgotten forgotten area there's a there's a lot of people straight straight into yeah. powered flight and then looking straight towards mm. uh commercial flying and gliding seems to be pushed to one side a bit of a niche but i think um i think it's a good starting point it's like karting in motorsport you know if you, the, the best yeah. yeah the best racing drivers always come from karting in the background and i suspect the best pilots probably have done some gliding in the in the past that's you've got to get it right so you you haven't got the option to get it wrong that's yeah. right and you understand i think you understand the weather more you understand the conditions the same with paragliding really you really get to understand about wind speed and and you know different sort of weather uh, connotations really i mean i have to say i am still a member of the gliding club but i have moved on to micro lighting right. which i i'm enjoying Fixed fixed wing micro lighting. I'm absolutely loving it, and I feel that this has been the perfect fit. So mm. that's where we are at the moment. Excellent. All right. So, with within the areas that you're working in in aviation, do you see or have you seen much in the way of development since you because you've been doing it now? So not for that long, really. But have you seen changes in? In the industry, in the in the the aircraft, in the materials, what's what's caught your eye? Well, that, that's a bit of a difficult one, really, because you know I paraglide. I was a paraglider for quite a long time, and obviously the technology with that moves on and on and on. Um, so I have to plug this in. Um, moves on quite quickly, um, but the design stays the same. But um, from aircraft, what I have noticed is that the electric electrification is is on the horizon isn't it yeah and i can see that sort of coming in closer and closer and closer now i don't know if that at this point will make it more affordable or if it will make it less affordable for those who are just starting the journey i don't know i i can't make my mind up on that um but the thing i would be most excited about and you'll probably laugh at this but i'm going to tell you anyway mm -hmm. is airships I am hoping that one day <laughs> yep. 
airships will be back with a vengeance and we can go on holiday on an airship and that will just be the most incredible uh, thing, I, I think. I, I, I would tend to agree that, but well, I, I know for a fact that they're, they're still around and I'm hearing more and more talk about airships. I've been, I was in Friedrichshaven a while back where the Zeppelin still exists. And you can go for a ride mm -hmm. in a Zeppelin. You can just turn up and mm -hmm. go zipping around the sky in a Zeppelin. And they are, I think there's a place for them. It's amazing how one major incident has really kiboshed that whole industry with the, you know, it's. Yeah. 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 There, there, there is so, no, it's a whole no. conversation on its own. <laughs> it is. But I, I find the whole thing, you know, there's quite a lot of new developments with them. And I think they're looking at helium and and different sources of, of power. I just think the whole thing is so exciting because they're so quiet mm. and they would be you know, pretty much environmentally friendly. And I think it is something that maybe we should be looking at pursuing for passenger travel. That would be quite fantastic, I think. Yeah, I think sometimes faster isn't always the solution, just just being able to do it. No. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's certainly a more chilled way of getting from A to B, I think. It would be like a cruise ship, wouldn't it? Yeah. I, I also think that um, heavy lift capability is... They're, they're now starting to look at airships again. So you have the Airlander and there's uh, there are a few other things being developed at the moment, which I've become aware of. Um, so, yeah, we could... Uh, our skies could be looking a little bit more like a science fiction movie in the not-too-distant future. But, well, I certainly uh, hope so. I'm a big sci-fi fan. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, I I think that that's an interesting one actually because again I don't think anybody's mentioned that so far, but uh, yeah, we'll certainly keep an eye on that one. Um, mm -hmm. so coming coming back to the whole STEM STEAM thing, so why should youngsters get involved in aviation? What what's what's in it for them? Why if, if you've got a, a teenager who's thinking well okay i'm gonna i'm getting to the end of school what do i want to do why would you nudge them in the direction of aviation because you're designing the future you're going to be a part of the future um everybody travels i don't think we're ever going to go back to you know almost feudalism where people lived and worked in their village and very rarely escaped to the neighboring town i think travel we've all got that appetite for travel now we've all got that appetite for global travel and transportation and that's not going to go away and i think to be part of the aviation industry is to be part of that future you are molding that future you are seeing what's coming around the corner there are so many different roles from design to marketing to engineering to fitting to flying you know there are so many different roles there is literally something for everyone in aviation mm -hmm. and it's just such a wonderful industry to be in and I do think that you know nowhere is going to be absolutely perfect but it is quite a level playing field from the people that I have spoken to and from my you know my experience within that industry mm -hmm. I, I think yeah, I, I agree. I, I also think that there is a thing about aviation that it's still cool in a way. You know, it's, uh, I mean, we've, we've had conversations with writers and journalists and all the rest of it. And you could be, you know, you, you might specialize in a particular subject, but saying that you're an aviation writer, I would put up alongside uh, a writer about, uh, popular music rock music or whatever it, there's still a, a there's a cool edge to being in aviation which I, I think in itself can be attractive it's not the main oh. reason for doing it but no but it is cool isn't it and i mean you yeah. know you've only got to look at maverick and the box office for that and it just made a simple sort of takeoff <laughs> of yeah. an air carrier just look like the most amazing dramatic thing you know the way it was filmed against the sunset etc and it is it is really cool i think it's a great sort of team effort but also there's room for people who don't work as part of a team there's also room for people who can just work on their own mm -hmm. you know from fault diagnosis to that sort of thing and i just think 
we don't promote it enough in the UK. I don't think it is on enough people's radars. I don't think it's on enough schools' radars. And again, you know, maybe that's something that needs to come back from the industry. Maybe that's a niche that we can we can look at and help out with. Yeah, I, I think you. I think you're right there. The, I mean, going back a few years, there there were a lot of aviation companies in Britain. They we built a lot of aircraft. We developed an awful lot of things. Um, the last 30, 40 years, it's very little's happened. You know, we do mm. weaponry very well, but uh, I think mm. for civilian aircraft, um, we don't do that at all well at the moment the, the there are the individual ex, uh, exceptions to that rule but as a as a country um i think we've forgotten about it and we we don't we don't shine our light on the schools and edu and, and on, the, on the colleges enough um yeah. i mean if you go into any school now any college technical college it's all formula one if, when you're looking at engineering it's, you know there's the formula and they've done that yeah. And they have done that so well. Yeah. They've done that so well with you know, form, uh, projects like Formula Student, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. I don't know why, in some ways, the aviation industry has kind of been left behind. I know that there are sort of student aviation projects that, that do go on, but it, it isn't in the league of motorsport. No. And they but are having you know, a field day with it, really. Yeah, the, I think it. I mean, a lot of it's just down to good marketing, you know. And uh, anybody who's looking for a job mm -hmm. in marketing, get involved in aviation because there's a big gap there waiting for you. So, but yeah, I think it's it's getting hold of kids. I mean, I, I, I did an event with some youngsters recently, and it was it was fantastic. Um, and we we gave out some little foam gliders, and one of the we got a, a message back from the school saying that one of the youngsters had managed to he got two of the the little glider planes that we gave them and um he just sent a message to us saying that he was building a hangar for them so they would stay safe you know it's just yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant great absolutely fantastic this so. is great yeah that's it i mean aviation has that wow factor it's yeah. still wow isn't it that something that is so big can yeah. fly through the air and not fall out of the sky it still is a thing of wonder yeah yeah when you when you're standing at the end of a runway and something either comes in or goes out you, you still go yeah. woof yeah that's something else yeah. so time has marched on so i'm mm -hmm. going to ask you the big question of the day mm. and that is so what is your favorite aircraft and why now you can you can wobble around it a little bit you can select a couple mm -hmm. to discuss but uh, i'm going to push you for one at the end Okay, no, no, I can tell you exactly what it is because I've been fortunate to work on quite a few projects with them. And it's uh, one of the early Mark Spitfires. Oh, wow. Okay. The Merlin engine. <laughs> Not the Griffin. The Griffin's fine, but for me, it's got to be purity. It has to be the Merlin. Right, okay. So Merlin engine, Spitfire. Any any particular one? Or are you thinking of a, a particular one aircraft or just the, that, that Mark? Just, just the very early marks from yeah. sort of Mark One to Mark Six, I think. And I would specifically like to barrel roll one. That is my dream. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. That sounds fantastic. I mean, it's yeah. I will. I, I shall reveal this. Out of the, the all the people we've interviewed so far, you're the first one to go for the Spitfire, which I find really is, now. Yeah. I thought everyone said that. Yeah. Well, that that was my anticipation. But uh, not you're the first yeah, yeah. one for the Spitfire. You can ch chalk that one up as a, a a big tick. I will do, yes. But uh, yeah, I, I've sat in a few, but uh, I've been up up close and personal. But um, the flight has yet eluded me. But uh, there's still time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. There's because there there are quite a few now kicking around uh, two seaters where hmm. it's not cheap, right enough. They're not. But, they're uh, not cheap. I mean, in this. Tribute Squadron as well, based down at Enston, um, the Ace, Ace Squadron as well, where they're building those. So I think, you know, the Spitfire, <clears throat> yes, it's iconic. And yes, it's, it's probably something that anybody, you know, that you tapped on the shoulder could name. But I think with the Spitfire, it's always had that symbol. It's always been that symbol of hope and resilience. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, 
there's a story there for modern day really there's so many different things that we could attach to the to the values of that from crowdfunding which we think of as a modern day thing mm -hmm. spitfires were crowdfunded you yeah. know and there's all those sort of elements of how we like all the good things that we have today that were actually embodied in that plane and i think that's really kind of what it means to me it, there, there is something about the Spitfire. I mean, it, it, it does sound, it can sound a bit corny, but mm. when you see one, especially when you see one low and fast and doing something, then you get it. You know, again, it's one oh, of these things straight <laughs> through your chest. That's it. Oh, my goodness. There's no sound like it. I mean, you know when there's one in the air. You, yeah. You just uh, know. They are, they are something else. And they are beautiful as well. I mean, aesthetically, they just look aesthetically beautiful yeah especially the very early ones it's just beautiful yeah simple um clean loud <laughs> very loud that's what we like we like the loudness yeah. you can hear them coming as they roar behind you beautiful yeah i uh, must admit they are and they, they're not far off well some of them yeah they're not far off 100 years old yeah yeah, yeah. thinking about that yeah yeah so I think my, one of my my favorite I think I got this right is the the last Spitfire that was used by the Royal Air Force. It was decommissioned in the beginning of whatever year it was, and it was less than nine months before the prototype for the English Electric Lightning flew. And that's that's the crossover. Yeah. That's how close the crossover was. It was less than wow. nine months between the Spitfire and the Lightning. Yeah. I mean, we kind of think of them as being sort of slightly nostalgic and antiquated, don't we? But yeah. um, but, yeah. but there we go, yeah. Tiger Moths were, were, I suppose, at the time, you know, they were sort of trained, they were used for training World War II pilots. And, I mean, they were probably well past the sell-by date, weren't they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, and they, 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 that's another story, the, the Tiger Moth. That's, again, another conversation that we need to have. So, Bev, we're out of time, just about. So, to, to wrap things up, uh, first of all, thank you very much for joining me on the short circuit. It's been a pleasure talking to you again, and I hope to, that we shall get together for a bit more of a natter. And you can come and visit us over at RAF Coltishall and come and have a look at the Swift outfit. Um, so we'll wrap it up. So you were so you're doing academic studies. You're a strong advocate of STEM, stroke STEAM. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You've got yourself off the ground, not from a uh, you know, straight after school, but later in life, you managed to get your paragliding. You're now doing fixed wing micro lights, and uh, you are representing the British Women Pilots Association. Is that the right way around? I've got that. That's correct. Excellent. Yep, that's right. So, Bev, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, we will speak to you in the not too distant future. Okay, thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure. So that was Bev Reardon. She's one of those people you can tell they are smiling just from their voice. Her enthusiasm is infectious and it's clear that she's a person operating in her ideal environment. Aviation is an arena that generates such passion in those that it touches and Bev is a prime example. That passion has driven her into the air via the basic entry-level routes of paragliding, gliding and microlighting but she also shares that passion with the next generation through her professional skills as a STEM slash STEAM consultant, a classic case of paying it forwards. Her practical and pragmatic approach to getting involved is a bright example of how it can be done, dispelling some of the myths that can restrict ambition in our young people. With a yearning for the revival of airships and a desire to barrel roll a Spitfire, you have to admit that she's a singular personality fizzing with energy and just the sort of person that aviation needs to inspire our next generations. And that is exactly what we're looking for here on The Short Circuit. Fly safe. You have been listening to The Short Circuit, presented by Mike McLean and sponsored by Swift Aircraft with the hashtag InspiringAviation. This has been a Zoom Spike production.